Hello. Uh, we just ended uh, that uh, last uh, section of video. Uh, actually, we didn't end it, but the camera ended it because the battery uh, uh, was tired and went to sleep. But picking up, uh, was talking about centeredness and how that centeredness relates to thought streams um, and how if uh, you have problematic areas in your thought stream, which most of, most of us do, I was using the example of suicide, um, how dropping to center can actually um, relieve, end up relieving us of a lot of uh, problematic thoughts in our thought stream. And I was using the example, uh, uh, a simple example of feeling centeredness, the five-year-old's um, creation of the universe thing, where the, the child is inhaling from the ends of the cosmos to her Big Bang center as her body expands to fill the cosmos. At the top of the inhale, all of her subatomic particles and atoms and molecules are filling the whole universe, and that's potentiality, mainly because the point at the center of her consciousness is entangled with the point of the Big Bang because each point, uh, in a sense, is the center of the universe. So, the exhale back out to the ends of the universe as her body comes back home uh, sweeps that potential through all of her subatomic particles, atoms, and molecules, and cells as, as they all come back home to her body, or his body, at the end of the exhale. Now, that uh, gives you, tends to give you a feeling of centeredness. Um, and there's also a Tai Chi type uh, thing that I've run into where you're walking slowly along, inhaling from the ends of the universe to your center, exhaling back out as you're walking along, which is, um, uh, it's not as easy to feel centeredness doing that. It's much easier to feel it as you're standing still to feel that centeredness. And at that center, there is nothing happening except the story of the center. So, as uh, I would be, or she, or he, or it would be inhaling um, from the ends of the universe to the center and back out, and that feeling of centeredness. Now, while doing that, um, allowing your thought stream to go wherever it goes, so it's very likely uh, in our busy lives that um, different areas of our identity, which we were talking about before, has uh, taken us away from the childlike uh, experience of nirvana, um, different stories that we tell ourselves associated with our identity can easily cross our minds while we're doing this inhaling and exhaling. And um, the way I share this stuff is we allow any thought to cross through the mind. Uh, so the stream of consciousness is completely open and random to its flow, however it wants to flow. What am I going to be eating for dinner? Uh, what's my girlfriend doing, et cetera, et cetera. And so allowing those thoughts to, to happen while we're doing this centeredness breathing, and actually I call it circulating with the universe also, uh, because our intention and our visualization is covering the whole cosmos. So the problematic thoughts that, and especially if you're in a crisis situation, that keep crossing through your mind, um, as you're doing this centered breathing, you notice that the thought, those thoughts tend to start breaking up. They, the incidence of them coming through, oh, here comes that thought again, Oh, and there it goes again. And once you experience the spaces between the thoughts increasing, you start getting a faint hint of safety. 
uh, of safety at the center. Um, and actually that can eventually lead to the problematic thoughts uh, being very far apart and hardly ever crossing your mind uh, if you experience this centeredness kind of thing enough. Another thing that goes with this centeredness is the alpha wave brain state with, whose attributes are peace, bliss, uh, uh, alertness, uh, which is one reason why we're standing while we're doing this. If we were sitting down and started feeling peaceful, we might just go to sleep. So standing is a, a way that I share this with folks. Um, so at center there, there are other things that can happen besides your thought stream healing itself. If you uh, play around with and experiment around with this thing enough, you don't have to believe me if you actually end up experiencing what I'm talking about. And I don't expect anybody to ever believe me. I don't expect myself to ever believe anybody else. So it's all a matter of experimentation and playing around with these things. Breathing is also associated with this center thing, obviously. Uh, inhaling from the ends of the universe to your center, exhaling back out. And abdominal breathing is the best. Um, that abdominal breathing is the way babies breathe. We come into the world that way. The exhale uh, is like a bellows uh, that you blow on a fire. <sighs> like that. The inhale, your tummy gets fat. It's almost like you're breathing into your tummy. The exhale, <sighs> your tummy goes back in at the end of the exhale. If I let those muscles go, that's my inhale. And that's just the reverse of how we usually end up breathing, uh, and especially in this culture, that is breathing in our chest. <sighs> We've been taught we have to fight uh, and struggle to survive, and we have to think a lot. And because of that, uh, busy thinking and having to deal with all the complexities of, of the society, your breath rises up from where it was when you were born, up towards your brain, which is thinking, and you end up being <laughs> short breaths like that. Toxins end up building up at the bottom of your lungs, unless you happen to be running or jogging. Uh, but if you're breathing abdominally, uh, your lungs fill from the bottom up. So my inhale, real slow inhale, fills my tummy up, I'm fat now. My exhale, now my tummy is small. The advantage of that is that the exhale, which is the creative part, massages your small intestines, which have the most dense feel-good endorphin receptor sites in your body. The second most dense feel-good endorphin receptor sites are the brain stem, which controls breathing. So babies come into the world breathing to feel good, and we can return to that. So in many ways, what I'm sharing is returning us to the best aspects of babyhood or young childhood uh, without seeing the faces of the angels necessarily. So that centeredness also can be associated with uh, what people would call miraculous healing. Uh, and I'm going to try to share with you how, how that can happen. Um, the first part of that that I'd like to share is what's happening in our bodies associated with our thought streams and our emotions. Uh, it's been figured out through the ENCODE project, which is, uh, I guess, about seven or eight years ago, they used to say that the 98% of the DNA was junk. Uh, and the ENCODE project, they spent like uh, millions of dollars to investigate it. And it says, oh, 98% of the DNA is a complex language that mirrors our thoughts and emotions. And it passes those thoughts and emotions 
directly to our cells on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So our thought stream and our viewpoint about who we are and what we're doing and all of that and our identity has a huge amount to do with what's happening in our cells. When we're at center and we have allowed our thought stream to be in play and we've experienced the problematic aspects of that thought stream becoming farther and farther apart and we end up being fairly free of the th parts of our thought stream that that we don't like or things about ourselves that we don't like that's reflected in our cells and if we experience this alpha wave thing which is uh, tends to be the brain state associated with this uh, meditative uh, bliss um, our cells like that um, and the more pleasure that we experience associated with all of this means the more pleasure that our cells are experiencing and that is a foundational part of this healing stuff that I was talking about before uh, these miraculous healings of, well I don't really call them miracles myself because I don't think anything is a miracle it's just that we don't understand how some things work and we call them miracles but um, the different diseases from cancer to emphysema to hepatitis C that I've seen uh, these meditative uh, uh, worlds that I share have a, uh, a healing effect um, are always there waiting uh, on the edge of our consciousness. So if I become used to dropping into this centeredness thing that automatically starts uh, the healing process and there's another aspect that I add to that which has to do with the work of Dr. William Bingston, who was a student at St. Joseph's College uh, years ago. And uh, my friend Caleb here is, uh, is, is doing the video here. And uh, I think we're, uh, I don't know if we're, are we limited on batteries? Um, no, we're totally good for now. How long have we got? Um, it doesn't really tell me. I keep checking it, so. I'm guessing we should have like 30 minutes to an hour. Okay, well we'll, we'll keep going on then. For <laughs> So Dr. William Bengston was a student at St. Joseph College and uh, in the summertime he, his uh, work in the summer was uh, working a roofing job and one of the, his uh, uh, fellow workers, uh, this Ben guy, it turned out was involved in healing of cancers and all kinds of terrible diseases and so um, Dr. Bengston, who wasn't a doctor then, William Bengston said, well, can I come along and watch some of this healing stuff? Which he did, and he was really enchanted by uh, the ability of this guy to be around all of this healing. So he said, well, Ben, can we take this, uh, your healing technique into the lab and set up a clinical situation to try to figure out why it works. So the head of the biology department there ordered a bunch of mice. They injected the mice with a cancer that no mouse had ever survived past 27 days. It was a common cancer that was um, put in these poor mice all over the country for years and probably all over the world. Um, and they were gonna bring Ben in to do his healing technique on the mice. Well, at the last minute, Ben said, I don't like science, and I'm not going to do your clinical stuff, so just forget it. Well, that kind of pissed off the head of the biology department that had set up this expensive experiment, uh, who said, well, Bill, you do the healing. And Bill said, well, I can't do the healing. I'm not a healer. Well, we got all these mice that we've injected with cancer. we got to do something. So, Bengston decided to try to do the healing and in talking with Ben Ben had told him well the way this works is I have 20 images of things that I would like to have in my life that I have memorized 
and I've learned to cycle these images through my mind at an ever more rapid pace till they're like a blur and I put my hands on the person that's ill and cycle those images through my mind to get me out of the way so the energy can flow from my left hand through the person to my right hand up my right arm through my head back down my left arm and kind of a circuit like that so Bengston would hold a box of mice and he had selected out these 20 images that he would like to happen in his life and practice cycling them through his mind at an ever more rapid pace. And to his shock, uh, doing that like an hour a day for a few weeks, 97% of the mice were healed to full life, which blew his mind. The biology, head of the biology department then tried the same thing with the similar results. Ninety-something percent of the mice are healed. And no mouse had ever survived that cancer more than 27 days. So then they wondered, well, uh, I wonder if we can teach this. So they recruited zoology and biology students who were atheists. They all, all they wanted was atheists. They didn't want belief involved in this at all. No faith. In fact, if some of the atheists thought it's possible to heal through some other way, they didn't want them. They only wanted the ones who thought it was impossible. So, they, he had a six weeks course on teaching the kids how to cycle stuff through their minds. And these students ended up experiencing the same thing. Over 90% of the mice were healed to full life. They did that at 10 different universities and also with people but not in a clinical setup. So I was very impressed with that, uh, and I thought, gee, is there some way I can combine this with the uh, Qigong, Tai Chi comes from Qigong, it's pretty much like Tai Chi, that I share with people, and maybe uh, some healing can take place. But I don't have, or couldn't find, 20 things that I would like to have in my life, because my life is already complete, so I had to find a way to access hypercycling of images um, of things that I found astounding and beautiful. Well, to me, the universe is astounding and beautiful. So, the path of the inhale from the ends of the universe to my Big Bang Center and back out contains trillions of potential images. And I thought, well, let's see now. Um, but I'm not going to be seeing each one of those images, so what's the deal? And listening to Bengston teach his class, uh, he would have a drum that he would... Each one of those was a image passing through the student's mind. Uh, and then he would go, go faster and go back slower and faster and faster and faster and then he would say now double that and I thought huh what do you mean double that how would that be possible well it would be with intention and after a while he would say now double that I thought well this is really wild uh, so they're only using their intention to double the speed of the images passing through well, that would easily fit my inhale from the ends of the universe to my Big Bang Center and back out because I celebrate the whole universe. So, I started sharing that with, uh, and it turned out that after I ran into that, that uh, I had people referred to me that had cancer and other diseases and shared these techniques with them and they experienced healing except for the one who was in Florida with terminal cancer given a month to live. Uh, in that situation I was up here in Cincinnati uh, and I would hold a little energy ball in front of me, an imaginary energy ball, and I would imagine her drifting into the energy ball and I would be cycling energy from my left hand through her to my right hand, up my right arm, up through my head, back around by my left arm, in a, in a cycle like that. 
Um, and I would do that for an hour each day after I finished my Qigong stuff. The reason I was doing this for so long is because I was motivated. It was my mother. I also realized that if I was trying to heal my mother, it would never happen. In fact, part of the whole Bengston thing was to get the person out of the way so the energy can go between the hands through the mice or through, in this case, an image of my mother in an energy ball. And so uh, I was celebrating while I was doing this for an hour a day or 45 minutes or something because it's hard to keep track of this once you get lost in, in this breathing thing. So after the first month the cancer hadn't advanced. After the second month it was halfway gone. After the third month the cancer was all the way gone and never came back. Which blew my mind. So that's kind of the foundation of what I share with people. And centeredness is the uh, key to the whole thing and allowing the mind to be in a randomized state of consciousness to where the, uh, the willpower and control is just not there at all. It's all completely wide open. So that's um, foundationally um, a, a way to play around with your stream of consciousness and a way to also play around with healing. And um, um, <laughs> uh, Caleb is now looking at the screen again. Now it's possible that um, uh, since I've completed that part that we may just uh, end this little video right here and start another one. Um, so folks enjoy and we're going to pick up uh, on another video uh, uh, coming soon.